Good morning, South Point. Good morning. Amen. Are you guys happy to be here? Turn to somebody and give them a high five. If you're doing something to make it an air high five. celebrate people coming into the kingdom of God, making Jesus Lord, dying in their sin, being raised up in resurrection life. We're going to celebrate that. And one of the few good things that came out of the pandemic is that we've always tried to figure out how to do water baptism and include everybody because we'd do it outside and you'd stop to watch and of course folk wouldn't. 
And, uh, and I thought, that's not right. And so it's worship. This whole thing is worship. And uh, so we, what we, we learned then in the pandemic, we'll pipe it in in the middle of our worship moment and celebrate together. So it's right, and we're going to watch them, and I'm going to let the guys have it here in a minute. It goes out into the rotunda under cameras and live out there. They're being baptized, but we're going to celebrate each one in here. Amen? And it's worth It's not one of those things you go, oh, that was nice. It's, I mean, it's hallelujah, thank you, Lord, for that soul, all right? So I'm going to turn it over to the guys out into the rotunda. Guys, it's all yours. Tell us who's getting baptized. All right, this is Naomi, and she's been coming to the church for a while, but she has never been baptized. She's actually been serving Jesus for a long time, but is ready to get baptized. Naomi, are you ready to serve Jesus for the rest of your life? Is he your Lord and Savior? Upon your confession of faith, Naomi, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. We have Elliot DeVries. His family's been coming here for like 18 years. Elliot was born, raised at South Point, and Elliot, you're saying that you believe Jesus is your Lord, that he died and rose again, and you're gonna follow him for the rest of your life. Go ahead, hold your nose, buddy. Upon your confession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right, well, this is Isaiah, and this is really cool because Isaiah is Naomi's son. In fact, Naomi's whole entire family is getting baptized together today. I asked Isaiah um, why he wanted to get baptized, and he said, because I'm ready to accept my life to Jesus. Isaiah, are you ready to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior? All right, upon your confession of faith, Isaiah, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, next we have Nolan DeVries. Uh, he's getting baptized, and Nolan, you're saying in front of all of us, you believe Jesus is your Lord, and you're going to follow him for the rest of your life, right? Okay, go ahead and hold your nose. Upon your confession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. All right, well, this is Jocelyn, and Jocelyn has been coming to the church for six months now and has decided to go all in for Jesus. Jocelyn, are you ready to follow Jesus for the rest of your life? All right, upon your confession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, next we have Dylan. Jocelyn is his, his wife. And uh, in the baptism class, Dylan was like, you know, I gave my life to Jesus a while ago, but I kind of fell away not living for him. And he's made the decision that I'm going to start living for Jesus and surrender fully my life to him. Isn't that right, Dylan? All right, upon your confession of faith, go ahead and hold your nose, buddy. Upon your confession of faith, I baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. All right, well, this is Naomi's other son, and his name is Emmanuel. Emmanuel, are you ready to follow Jesus for the rest of your life? Do you believe that he died on the cross for your sins? and that he rose again on the third day. All right, upon your confession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, next we have Judah, Naomi's other son. The whole family's getting baptized today. So Judah, you are saying in front of us that you believe Jesus is your Lord and Savior, and you're gonna follow him for the rest of your life. Okay, buddy, go ahead and hold your nose. Upon your confession of faith, Judah, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. All right, well, this is Brianna, and she has decided to go all in for Jesus. 
And I asked her, I said, why are you getting baptized today? And she, she said, because Jesus saved me. And because I want to set an example for my children, which I love. Brianna, are you ready to serve Jesus for the rest of your life? Are you ready to set an example for your children? All right. Upon your confession of faith, Brianna, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Next we have Micah, Naomi's last son. Micah, you are saying in front of us that you believe Jesus is your Lord and Savior, and you're going to follow him for the rest of your life. Okay, buddy, go ahead and hold your nose. Upon your confession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. All right, stand back up. I think we're done. Oh, no, we're not. One more. <laughs> One more, Lord. One more. <laughs> All right, this is Lily. Lily, are you ready to follow Jesus for the rest of your life? All right, upon your confession of faith, Lily, can you put your hand on your nose? I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Just making sure. <laughs> all right, let's all stand back up. How many of you think we need to pray for Naomi right now, raising all those babies? My gosh. Help Lord, help her Lord. Raise great giants. Hallelujah. All right, we got a reason to worship. They're born again. We're born again. Our friends are going to get born again. So we're just excited about what Jesus is doing. So Lord God, thank you for these precious souls that you brought into the kingdom of God. Keep them, preserve them. May this day be something special to them and an advance in their growth and knowledge of you. Bless it all. Bless us as we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Here we go. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, we worship you. We worship you. on your promise but still I see the giant in the midst of chaos I will look through eyes of faith even when no wars rage I know it's not my battle your spirit goes before me, so every enemy must bow. Yeah. You make mountains move, you pull your throne down. None can stand against you, can stay down the crowd. Every fear is silent, for you and it's true. When it seems there's no way.
Yes, he does. Nothing's impossible for my God will overcome. Yes. Come on, help me sing it. Say, you turn my doubts
Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There's nobody like our Jesus. There's nobody like 
got Jesus. South Point, give Jesus his praise. There's nobody like God Jesus. Come on, give him his praise. Give him his praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Why are we making a big deal of him? Why? We just celebrated it. All those, all those souls who just got baptized. What does that mean? What does that mean, church? What did it mean for you when you did it? What, what does it mean? New life. The old is dead and the new has come. The you that couldn't do anything is dead and the new life has come. The power, the love, the identity, the purpose. Come on, church. Come on. How can we, how can we not? How can we not lift them high? Back to the chorus. Come on, can we lift up our hands real quick? Can we just can we just honor him? Honor your king right now. If you're not a Christian, I don't expect you to do this. But if you're but if Jesus is your Lord and Savior, lift those hands up right now. So we lift you high. Forever lift you high. High within our hearts, high within our hearts. Yes, Jesus, you alone, our rock, our cornerstone. High within our hearts, high within our minds. Jesus, we lift you high. Let it be evident everywhere that we go. May we magnify your name. Everywhere that we go, may we be a witness of your love, of your power, of your compassion, of your grace, of your kingdom. Be high and lifted up in the lives of your children. And every child of God said, Amen. Amen. I give him one more praise. Yes, it is good to be in the house of love with you guys. I'm so glad you're here. Why don't you turn to somebody and, and say, thank you for coming, and you may be seated. First Peter chapter 1, verse 3, our text for the day. It says this, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again. And here's the resurrection, because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation. out of the grave because he's alive all of our expectations should just soar now this is our message as a church this is our message as the people of God if you will cry out to God him by his spirit he'll never let you feel alone you'll know you have the ability to get through this you'll walk to the other side the resurrection tells us it's true Sunday was amazing. Oh, that's so funny. I saw all the kids 
when they started running down the thing, I think that was one of the false starts. They went about four steps and turned and looked. I wonder if they were so ready for those golden eggs, man. I tell you, it's like combat war out there at our Easter egg hunt when you got golden eggs and prizes involved. So thank you so much for being here at South Point Community Church. My name is Jason. I'm one of the pastors here on staff, and we are so glad that you are here with us today, especially if this is your first time. So thankful for you. I want to uh, grab your attention to our Connect card. Uh, if you're here uh, live with us, it's right there in your seat. We would love for everyone in the room to go ahead and pick that up, but fill this Connect card out. If you're a regular attender, a member, uh, you can just fill out your name, let us know you're here. Uh, if you're watching online, there'll be a link there in the chat section that you can just follow. You can also take your phone out. There's a QR code that, that pops up on the screen there that'll uh, give you the link for our online uh, version of the Connect card. Also, you can text my SEC with no spaces to the number 484848. That'll also text you a link. But we would love, if you're new here with us, or your guest, uh, we would love for you to give us as much information as you're comfortable with. We're gonna give you a call. We wanna help you take a next step here at South Point. We wanna answer all your questions. And uh, we're, like I said, just so, so thankful that you guys are here. If you're, if you're here in the room, just drop it in the offering bucket uh, as you leave. Now there's some great next steps you can take here at South Point Community Church. One of them is the Grow Track. Uh, Grow Track is uh, are the first four Sundays of every month. It's right after service. If you, you go out these doors, you go to the right, you go up the stairs right there by the men's restroom uh, up there. And the Grow Track is where you're going to learn about what we believe here at South Point Community Church and how you can get involved here. It's the next step. It's the jumping point off to getting connected to our life groups. Maybe it's serving. Maybe you want to you wanna learn how to read your Bible effectively or, or learn how to pray effectively. All of that is covered in the Grow Track. It's going to help you take that next step with Jesus here. So make sure you get on the grow track here at South Point Community Church. Also, if you're watching online or even if you're here live with us, go ahead and share the service. We have countless uh, testimonies of people who saw the online, saw our Facebook stream happening or maybe our YouTube, and then they got connected and their lives were changed. Jesus became their Lord because they saw something online. So thank you for doing that every single uh, Sunday. And raise your hand if you have fifth graders. You got any, anybody, any fifth grade parents in the, in the room today? Well, we have a class that's for your fifth grader right after this service. It's right across the rotunda up the stairs in room 241. And Pastor Tyler and Miss Christina are gonna talk to you guys about transition. This is a big year for you, for your student. He's going into middle, or he or she is going into middle school. So they wanna talk to you about that transition and what it means here at South Point going from SEC kids up to second floor middle school ministry. So right after service, just go ahead and head across the way, go up the stairs in room 241. And men, I, I don't know if you know this or not, but three weeks from this past Friday is the Advanced Men's Conference. Come on, give a hoorah if you guys are coming. Uh, that was about a hundred and some guys. I know there's a lot more guys in here, so I need to talk to you for a second because I, the ones who have already signed up for the 300 t-shirt, you're wondering, I, I, I wonder how many questions I get. Where's my shirt? Where's my shirt? What number am I? Well, we were hoping to have them this week, they only have one printed, so you know who got that one. But your shirt, your shirt is gonna be here Monday, but you need to sign up right now today for the men's conference. Go ahead, they're gonna put a picture of our T-shirt in here. Everyone who signs up from South Point is going to be part of the SCC 300. And you wanna be chosen. You don't wanna be sit home, amen? You don't wanna be the guy that's at home in this conference. And let me tell you, to sign up, really, you just gotta text 300, you can do it right now. Text 300 to 484848. We'll send you a link to sign up. It's $55. That's going to include uh, Friday night food, breakfast, Saturday morning breakfast, Saturday uh, afternoon uh, lunch, tons of games and prizes. I mean, it's, it's a phenomenal weekend, life-changing weekend. So you want to make sure you get in, in in the 300. But let me tell you why you really want to sign up. Because there's spaces in your life around you that God has designed you to take back. As a father, as a man, as a husband, as a friend, as an employee, as a boss, there's something supernaturally that God has chosen you that only can happen if you move in and start taking back those spaces. And that is what this conference is about. I promise you, if you sign up and you show up, you are going to leave changed. You're gonna have a plan. Your faith is going to be on high, and the devil is going to start losing ground in everywhere you walk. 
And who wants to be that kind of man? Who wants to be the SCC's chosen and show up for the conference and change everything around you? All you got to do is sign up right now. You only have a week left. If you want the shirt, you need to sign up like right now because I'm about to do the last order. So if you want your shirt, do that today. You can also do it right outside in the rotunda. Uh, there's a, be a table out there. You can stop by there, pay there. We'll get you on the list. Make sure you get your T-shirt, 300 T-shirt. We're all going to wear it the first night of the conference and show SCC strong. Amen? Amen. And also, guys, this Friday morning is our April monthly uh, prayer. You guys need to go ahead and make plans. Don't forget, it's the last Friday of every month, so at 6.30, we're going to have breakfast afterwards. But I need you 110 guys that's been coming. I need you to find a friend. Find a guy in this church. Bring him with you. And maybe you've never heard of it. Maybe this is your first time here. I don't know if I want to show up to men's prayer. We're not going to embarrass you. We're not going to call you out. But I promise you, I promise, you don't have to say a word, but if you just are here and we do our prayer confessions, you are going, you're going to have the most productive, crazy Friday you've had in your life because you are going to be filled with his spirit and filled with power. Amen? Amen. So show up for prayer this Friday, and I hope you guys are ready for an amazing word of God today. Thank you so much uh, for being here. Let's welcome Pastor Russ to the stage this morning. So I'm a walking billboard today. That's what I am. And uh, they were supposed to all come, not all of them, but several of them were supposed to come in. And I, my, I know Jason said one came in, so he got it. I am one of 300. It says right there, one of 300. I know everybody, I'm going to tell you this right now. Guys are going, yeah, but we had to register. Jason will tell you. I am registered, 55 bucks I paid to go to this thing. I don't ask you guys to do anything. I haven't for years. I've always registered for these things. So I uh, just want you to know I paid for my shirt. No, no special privileges here. You know, I was sitting, I was listening to Jason just real quick. Uh, and I don't think I need to say anything else. But one thing I want to remind you each week, because we, we tease and have a lot of fun. and We get down to trying to conjole our men to do what they need to do and everything and have a lot of fun. But for a couple of weeks, I told Jason, I said, just hold to this one thought. And uh, this conference, in my opinion, and I, will be different than any other we've ever had because of what God is already doing in our church. You tend to watch and see the winds of the Spirit when they get in a sail, and then you see that God is doing something. So you're going, so whatever we get in the right place with our faith, then God is going to do something special with his favor on it. And I honestly believe, I, you know, I know if you've been to a conference, you're going, you know, I, it was great, but man, for a, whole, a Friday night and a, a whole day Saturday, I just don't know Russ. I promise you, I mean this, you seriously are making a mistake if you don't come. Yeah. As a man of God, please Pay the $55 and come. And, uh, and I am sincerely convinced that God is going to change your life. And, uh, and I mean it in a very, very positive way. If, if, I'm a, if I'm a wife and I got a man in the house who's thinking about not going, I use every tactic I've got to get that man to be here. And everybody said, all the men are going, hold on, Russ. <laughs> be giving her power in my life. She's already got it, pal. She's had that for a long time. You just don't want to admit it very often. Me either. And uh, I try to act like I'm leading my house. All right, so here we go. I am. Most of the time. Um, I got we got, I got I to mention that I got tickled. We're probably going to have to come up with a different word in today's world that our kids are transitioning. And uh, so we're probably going <laughs> to... The, vo the vocabulary keeps changing on our world right now. Jason kept going, we're transitioning. I went, uh-oh. And uh, somebody, I, DeSanta is going to be calling me. You know what I'm saying? They say, you can't be teaching that at your church. That's not even allowed in the public school system. And, uh, and so we got to... <laughs> yeah. I just couldn't resist it. For those of you that are offended, you, you'll do well. You'll forgive me. That's what God has called you to do. You'll need a lot of that if you're going to hang around here with me, all right? So that's just the way it goes. All right, so here we go. We're in the life of David. Let me see what time it is so I know how far I went over when I'm too long. I want to at least understand that. So um, uh, the life of David, and today I want to talk about when they moved the Ark of the Covenant. Now, a lot of you that have been in church most of your life or a long time know this story. Some of you won't. I'm going to catch you up. You don't have to know it. And, uh, but uh, we're studying the life of King David 
And uh, it's just an amazing, it's been rich, and, and uh, been, been, it's really helped me. But I'm going to go with this one different than I ever have before. There was a, there's a way to actually teach the moving of the ark that always comes out. I mean, it's something around that. And I'm going to address it barely, like it usually is addressed, but I'm going to go somewhere, something totally different with it this morning. So I want to give you a little context first. Um, the Ark of the Covenant is, a, is basically a box. It's a, it's a wooden box um, that was overlaid with gold and um, uh, had two angelic kind of figures on it with their wings reached out towards one another. They called them cherubim. Inside the box um, was a golden jar with manna in it, so somehow it was supernaturally preserved um, uh, because manna always disappeared after a day. So this is supernatural manna, and it was kept in this container. Um, Aaron's rod, a, a, a branch from a tree that budded after it had been cut off, um, which is a story behind all that, that was in there. And then the tablets with the law on it, the Ten Commandments, were in there and kept in that box. And that box was carried uh, all around wherever the people of God were. The box went, actually the box went first. But that's, I'm not going to teach on anything about the box much uh, because it misses it. Hebrews chapter 9 in the New Testament actually talks about it. So if you want to get your Bible out and look there, um, or we'll put it on the screens for you. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 1. Now even the first covenant had regulations for worship and an earthly place of holiness. For a tent was prepared, the first section in which were the lampstand and the table and the bread of the presence. These are other pieces of furniture that were in um, this kind of worship tent. It is called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a second session, section called the most holy place, having the golden altar of incense, the Ark of the Covenant, covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden urn holding the manna, and Aaron's staff that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. So there's the scripture for what I just said. Above it were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat of these things we cannot now speak in detail. Now, here's kind of a rendering. All of these, there's several of them. So I wanted to show you kind of a picture of what it looks like. So here's the Ark of the Covenant, I think. It's supposed to come up here somewhere. There it is. I didn't know which screen it was coming on. So it looks something like that. that that's what it looked like. What was that right there? All right, and so, um, and, and I'm not going to teach about it much, but the lid, just leave that there for a second. The lid of, of the covenant was called the mercy seat. So if you see the term mercy seat in scripture, it was kind of like above that, just right above those angelic wings, because God would appear and manifest right there and speak to the priests or the people of God from there. And so it was always called the mercy seat. A lot of teaching that would be great to do around that sometime, but we're not today. Uh, where is that box now? You can pull it off now. Where is that box located now? According to Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Last Ark, <laughs> it's in a national archive in a box where no one's ever seen since um, that it was stored there. And uh, so that's where it is to this date, and I'm sure God will bring it out whenever he's ready to see it again, all right? Uh, I think it made an appearance in another movie, but that's where I saw it kind of disappear forever. But for our purposes today, for our purposes today, that box represents the presence of God amongst his people. That's, that's all you need to know today to understand the power of what goes on in the life of David. So wherever that box was, that box said to the nation of Israel, I am with you. The box said it was a symbolic presence, a symbolic um, artifact. I'm going to call it an artifact um, so that would say, I am amongst you. All right, you got that? That, that's important. So of all the pieces of the furniture that were in this kind of tent, it was portable, that would move around with them when they moved around. They'd set the tent up. It had different places. They'd set up the different pieces of furniture right where they were supposed to go. But the most important piece of furniture was the Ark of the Covenant. Because if the presence of God wasn't there, it didn't matter what the rest of the furniture represented. So uh, it, was, it, was, it was a symbolic and a type and a shadow is a word that if you study, you'll see all the time it was a type and a shadow of a reality that was invisible. The presence of God is invisible. This box helped remind the people, I'm here. Now that's important. That's important. We are given in Scripture. In Scripture we are given, um, I call them artifacts, but symbols and rituals to teach and remind us of what God has done for us. Those symbols. We just saw one today. Water baptism is one of those rituals. It's a symbol. 
It has, it has a certain supernatural element to it, but only because of what it represents. All right, communion, if you receive the Lord's table, that is an artifact. It, it's a symbol, it's a ritual of something God has done. The bread is the body of Jesus, the grape juice is the blood of Jesus, and it's symbolic of him giving his life for our sin and dying on the cross for us. And, uh, and so taking of the Lord's table has deep, rich symbolism. And it's, and it's to be done and handled a certain way because of what it represents. All right, this is important. It's to be done a certain way because of what it represents. Now, this is important for, just for teaching purposes today. The artifact is not God. It isn't God. It represents him. All right, it's designed to help us focus on him. The communion table is designed to help us focus on him. Water baptism is designed to help us give a testimony to the world and be reminded ourselves that we've died to sin and been raised again to newness of life, and we live in that newness of life now. Water baptism has rich symbolism, but because of what it represents, it has a supernatural quality to it, but you can't give too much to the artifact. If you make too much of the artifact, you're making less of God. The artifact is to make much of God. And when you see that messed up, you'll see weird doctrines come out about supernatural qualities of the communion table that just are not taught in Scripture. You're taught about baptism having a supernatural quality that is not taught in Scripture. So you have to understand that it's symbolic and it is supernatural in quality because of what it represents, but it is only that. Everybody clear? So we don't disdain it. You don't have to do more to make these things holy. Because of what they represent, they are holy. And and when God says, do it this way, then do it that way. Don't make up other ways to do it. All right? Now, one more thought for context. So I just want you to have the context before I get into the point, so I'm going to read the actual story of bringing the ark in and what happened, but you have to understand this first. The ark had been out of the hands of the people of God for 70 years. Um, we don't have time to go back in and tell the whole story of how they lost the ark and how backslidden they got. and the, Their enemies actually ended up with the ark, and that was bad news for the enemies. And uh, anybody who's read their Bible knows that they tried to stick it in one of the temples, and all of their idols kept falling on their face, breaking into pieces until they got the got the ark out of there and uh, then then they tried to get then they put it somewhere else and everybody got diseases you try to handle god's anointing without god you're going to be in a mess and uh and so so there's a bunch of great stories in there and now finally the philistines tried to get rid of it it kept being a mess to them and uh, the philistines don't know what to do with the church without jesus Anyhow, there's another whole, yeah, I could go into relevancy all day long. We'll never get out of here. And uh, so let me just come back out of that, come out of that cul-de-sac and get back on the road that goes somewhere. And, uh, and, and but the, it had been gone for 70 years and now is basically in a city called kiriath Jerem, which is the city of the woods. It was basically out in the woods, deteriorating, just laying out there. The Ark of the Covenant, that box, the most holy piece of furniture to the nation of Israel is sitting out in the woods, deteriorating. Not even being cared for. So as soon as David becomes king and joins his two kingdoms together, that's another story. So a lot of these parts go, what now? Don't worry. Just know that there, were, there was a civil war amongst God's people. And when David became king, he brought the two parts back together. All right? So now he's king of all of Israel. And the first thing he does, he goes, we have to restore religious order. We have to restore spiritual order to the people of God because he was a man after God's own heart. And so he says, let's go get the ark and bring it back. First thing we got to do is go get the ark, make a place for it here, because it can't be over there. We can leave the rest of the furniture over there. That's a whole other story. But the ark, the presence of God has to be with us. And so he builds a little tent and says, we're going to come get that thing and stick it in that tent. All right? And that's where we'll pick up today. Now we're into our actual message in context. 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 1 through 15. Going to read a number of verses. Are you ready? Here we go. It's 2 Samuel 6, 1 through 15, if you're using your Bible. All right. David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000, and David arose and went with all the people who were with him from Baal, Judah, to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, who sits enthroned on the cherubim. 
And they carried the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. And Uzzah and Ahiho, the sons of Abinadab, were driving the new cart with the ark of God, and Ohio went before the ark. And David with, and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord. They were so excited to bring the, you know, the thing that represented his presence back with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. And when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God struck him down and there, <laughs> there because of his error, and he died there beside the ark of God. And I love this, and I'm not going to go into this today, but David gets angry. You know, when we do things wrong, and then God causes wrong things to happen, we tend to get mad at God. It's quite interesting how humans are. You know, God, why didn't you do it for me? I had a good heart. You're going to see that in just a minute. David was angry because the Lord had broken out against Uzzah, and that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. Perez means to break out against. And David was afraid of the Lord that day, and he said, how can the ark of God come to me? How do I get that in my house? I'll die. So David was not willing to take the ark of God into the city of David, but David took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite three months, and the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. And it was told King David, the Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. I didn't put this in my notes, but I have to just tell you this. I wanted to, but I had to cut it out. Whenever God is wanting you to come into his presence and you do it wrong and then that presence is absolved, he will do things to make you jealous for that presence. He will. You will start hearing of the testimony of others and going, that's supposed to be my testimony. And you'll start to pursue it again. So I put the point back in, but it was short. <laughs> and when those who bore the ark of the Lord had gone six steps, he sacrificed an ox and, and a fattened animal. And David danced before the Lord. He did it again. He was, I'm out there again with all of his might. And David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting with the sound of the horn. So happy ending. Sounds to me like, doesn't it, when you read this in 2 Samuel, you read this, David tried to get the ark. It didn't work out. He put the ark in the guy's house. The guy got really blessed. So David said, we got to go get that thing. And then he goes, so he says, let's try again. It's what it sounds like in 2 Samuel. Let's do it again. So he goes back, and this time it does the same thing. He dances before it. He's really excited, takes a bunch of people with him. This time he uh, sacrifices a few animals in front of it. But all in all, pretty much the same thing and brings it in. So it's like, hey, if at first you don't succeed, try again what it sounds like right but that is not what happened at all that's why you have to read the Bible to understand the Bible then you got to go to first Chronicles chapter 15 verse 11 through 15 and find out the part that's missing in second Samuel so let's go there together and then I'm going to draw you four or five conclusions and we'll be done all right then uh, first Chronicles chapter 15 verse 11 then David summoned the priest Zadok and Abiathar and the Levites Uriel Asiah Joel, Shemaiah, Eliel, you want to get up here and try to say these names? Um, Aminadab, and said to them, you are the heads of the father's houses of the Levites. Consecrate yourselves and your brothers so that you may bring up the ark, the Lord, the, Lord, the God of Israel, to the place that I have prepared for it. Now watch this. Watch verse 13. Here's what's missing in 2 Samuel. Because you did not carry it the first time, the Lord broke out against us because we did not seek him according to the rule. This is real big. So the priests and the Levites consecrated themselves to bring up the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel, and the Levites carried the ark of God on their shoulders with poles. That's usually what's taught most about. Is the anointing of God is not put in a cart, gang. It's carried on the shoulders of men and women. But I'm not going to teach that today. I've taught that many times. As Moses had commanded according to the word of the Lord. What I want you to see is this. David went home and go, what did we do wrong? Right. And he must have, either the priest came to him or he went to the priest and go, what, why did somebody die? And some priest had to have spoken up. Somebody had to speak up that understood the Torah. Somebody who actually read their Bible and said, well, we weren't supposed to put that on a new cart. It's supposed to have these poles put through it, and it's put on the shoulders 
of the priests. But because it was on a new cart and the oxen stumbled, the man put his hand out, and it's very clear in the Word of God, you don't touch the ark in its transport. You don't touch it. It's held up by the shoulders of men that are called to and designed and designated to carry it. And it has to be done that way. We have to understand this game. When it comes to certain things in Scripture, when we talk about the presence of God, it has to be done God's way. God has a design and a way. In our independent culture, we tend to try to create our own. You can't tr create your own religion with God. The Bible's already said how it's done. All right? So let me give you some lessons, some, some thoughts from this thing that happened that I think are really important. Totally different than anything I've ever done before on this subject. Number one, sometimes having the right heart is not enough. Sometimes having the right heart is not enough. David should have been told by the priest, hey, we're not supposed to be doing this. I don't know who didn't speak up or if they were afraid to because David was excited. I really don't know. But somebody should have spoke up and said, you know, who told you that that's the way it's done? Because right here in the Bible it says this is the way it should be done. Okay, really, really important. Because they, you normally in these situations go, but man, his heart was right. Wasn't David's heart right? I mean, nobody else had tried to go get the ark back. Saul certainly had never tried to get the thing back. David was trying to get the ark back. I mean, his heart was good. His, his, his heart was in the right places. So it looks to me like in religious things, if your heart is in the right place, everything ought to be all right. You might be doing a little bit wrong, but you're trying to do the right thing. But God goes, no, 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 no. No, no, no. You should have known. You, you should have known. There were prescribed ways to handle the presence of God. And that's what the people were taught with the ark. So the ark just didn't say that the presence of God was there. The Bible then says, here's how you treat the ark. And in the way you treat the ark, you would understand how to treat the presence of God. Right. And he said, so if we stop treating the ark the way it's supposed to be treated, you're going to forget how to treat me when I'm present. He said, so you're going to have to do it right so that you understand how to walk with me. I'm using the ark to teach you how to walk with me because, listen, God says, I want to walk with you. And this is how you do it. And they did it different. We can't make up our own way of following Jesus, gang. You can't make up your own way. Here's, a, here's the thing you want to watch out for. Watch out for this whenever you go. My God. Okay, yeah, okay I don't mind you saying that as long as your God is this God. But when it said, my God wouldn't do that, I'm going, well, he did. Or my God would never say that. Well, he did. I'm just saying, before you say, my God, is that something you designed or is that the God that Scripture has taught you? It has to be the right one. Sometimes, sometimes having a right heart's not enough. It's not enough. You've got to have things right. Passion no, I'll say this. The first thing, um, the first thing in being a Christ follower is to have a heart for him. Really, the first thing in being a Christ follower is to have a heart for him. I mean, that's what I don't like is when people m kind of pray a prayer, but there's no holy desire light up inside of them. I'm going, did you really give your heart to Jesus? Because usually when the Holy Spirit comes inside of you, there's something that happens. It might not happen right then, but like if I don't see you having a desire so I do think passion is first. I think having a right heart is first. I, I really do. And uh, because without it, you have a dead, lifeless religion. And I, I mean, if you're here today, you've never been in this place before. I, I would, now, maybe it's just because we sing loud songs with a rock band and have stuff on the screen. You just think, man, they're emotional. But I've seen them do this without that. I've done that without that. I don't need all that. I'm glad for it. It's fun. But I don't need that to worship Jesus with a glad heart. You just get me up there singing, and I'm going to be happy because my heart is full. I have a holy desire inside of me. And so that, that part, there's a certain passion. There's a certain element. I don't want to go to a super quiet church. I know some people do. They like that because I think it's because it's very safe. I want to be under an emotional assault at all times. Don't leave me alone. Go ahead and press in on me and make sure that my heart's on fire for Jesus. 
I know a lot of people don't like that. They don't see it that way. And, uh, but with safety, you get less. It's just all there is to it. But I'm glad you're safe, and I'm glad you love Jesus. And um, so I, I'm glad for that. But passion and good intention will not always be enough, right? They won't always be enough. That's why we need Bible study and discipleship so that we know how to take the passion and desire we got and guide it in such a way that God teaches us how to walk with him so that he can better walk with us. Sometimes, sometimes, having the right heart is not enough. All right, next one. Ignorance has a limit. Kind of like the first one, but not quite. Ignorance has a limit. Now, as we mature in our relationship with Jesus, um, our degree of responsibility in how we act and how we think should mature. It should change. Because with more knowledge of who God is, a greater responsibility comes. We know that from Spider-Man. <laughs> I have to admit, I wasn't very impressed with the first part of the movie, but when all the other Spider-Men started showing up, I thought, this is pretty good right here. And uh, yeah, this is, that, you know, I'm, I'm kind of getting a message here and all of this. And Anyhow, never mind. <laughs> you all know what I'm talking about. In the, yeah, hallelujah. All right. All right. Wait till I get to my Mandalorian. I'm coming. It is the way. All of you out here are going, what? It's just between me and them. <laughs> what was I talking about? In other words, you expect one thing from a child, another from an adult, do you not? How many times have you looked at somebody and said, you need to what? No. Oh. See, you've used that with some intensity before. You actually thought about somebody when you said that, didn't you? Somebody came in your mind, yeah, grow up, pal, which will tell you which sex is saying that, all right? And, uh, so it's... and I'll have to admit, men do tend to grow up a little slower than women, and all the women said... I know, I'm with you. I, I, I actually agree, but I'm offended by the way you say that. And, uh, and so, <laughs> I, I think new believers get away with stuff. I, I'm serious. And, on their intentions, not sin, their intentions. I think new believers come in and they just do things, they just do it wrong. And here's what God is thinking. Just like when you're watching your little kids do things, you go, oh, they're so ignorant. They don't know. So new believers do stuff, and God, I think, honestly, God watches his children go, they don't know. I'm going to bless that. I'm serious. But here, here's what you got to make sure you're not deceived by. When you're 17 and you have a pacifier, you look stupid. And God's embarrassed of the child he's raising. There's a point where you're going, ignorance has got a limit now. You're supposed to learn and then be responsible with that learning. And here, this, I think this teaches us right now. I was, there, there, listen, ignorance from a lack of teaching is one thing I, I just didn't know. I think God blesses things when you move in such a way that maybe isn't in perfect line with Scripture, but he knows you don't know. He knows what your heart is. The Spirit of God prays according to the Spirit because we don't always know how we, we should pray. So we know he moves for us. But then at some point he goes, okay, now, I'm not going to bless that this time because you got to grow up. You, you, you got to grow up. So, yeah, you got to get teaching. You got to get into discipleship. You got to read your Bible. You got to get in the purple book. You got to go to your life group. You got to go to church all the time. You got to listen to podcasts. There's so much way, so many ways to get taught now. There's no excuse for us not to be taught. And he goes, you, you, you got to find out how to do this right because doing it right teaches people about me and how I relate to them and how they relate to me. So, we're going to have to start doing it right. Ignorance from a lack of teaching is one thing. Ignorance from ignoring a thing is another. They're different. 
So I was in Nashville, and I went to this gym, and they had a track. And so I went on the track, and when I was going around, it goes all around the whole weight thing, you know. So, so I took some weights, and I was running around there. And I wasn't running. I had weights. I was walking. And uh, walking, and people was coming this way, but I didn't think any big deal about it. So I did it. I came around the second time, and the next guy that was working in the gym come running after me, and, man, he was mad. Bad day. And, uh, and, and he comes and says, hey, what are you doing? I said, I'm doing a farmer's walk. What you doing? And, uh, and, uh, and so, and, 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 and I, and I, but I knew, he said, can you not read? Oh, I said, I'm sorry. He goes, look, and I was standing right in front of it. I literally was standing right in front of it, a sign that said, on Tuesdays, you go this way. On Wednesdays, you go this, it was Tuesday. I was going that way, and there was, I mean, giant sign, giant sign. He goes, are you blind? And what could I do? I, I wanted to get mad at him because I thought you're a little overboard right now. I don't know what your wife said to you this morning and why you're taking it out on me. I don't know what didn't happen last night and why I'm the problem. I, I said, I don't know what's going on. I wanted to say all those things or his anger was coming up inside of me. I thought, I'm going to put one of these weights on your head. And, uh, you know, and I said, but, what, I thought, but, he's wrong. but here's the thing. I was looking right at the side. And I couldn't argue with the fact that I was very stupid in this moment. I thought, I have no excuse for walking the wrong way. And neither do you. There are times when you can get mad all you want because things aren't going right. But if you're going the wrong way and it says just as plain as the nose on your face, don't go that way. Go that way. Ignorance has a limit. Here's a quote from Albert Camus. The evil that is in the world always comes of ignorance, and good intentions may do as much harm as malevolence if they lack understanding. Sometimes our good intentions actually bring greater harm than they do good if we're doing it with the absence of knowledge we should have. Good. Amen? Third, this one I tried, gang. When I put this up, I tried to come up with something that was better. And I'm going to admit right now, this thing is too long and hard to figure out. But I could not come up with something better, so I'll help you. Number three, enculturation is a subtle and dangerous tool of the enemy. Enculturation is a subtle and dangerous tool of the enemy. So David had no excuse for his ignorance. The high priests of the day had no excuse for their ignorance. They had the right heart, but sometimes the right heart is not enough. But this one is interesting to me. Here's the definition of enculturation, that long word. The gradual acquisition of the characteristics and norms of a culture or group by a person, another culture, etc. In other words, you're swimming in certain kind of waters and eventually you become like the water you swim in. That's enculturation. Or you're around a certain way of things happening all the time and then that becomes part of who you are. It's, it's the impact of culture. And um, which I, I actually, well anyhow, not enough time. So David consulted, it says in 2 Samuel, with a bunch of men. He said he consulted with many of the leaders and here's what they came up with. Let's go get the ark. Let's get a brand new cart. Because that's what the Philistines hauled it around on. The Philistines, if you read back into Scripture, the Philistines put the ark on a new cart. And nothing happened to them. But of course, God doesn't care how the world treats the presence of God. He cares how his people treat the presence of God. They're the ones that should be respecting it. The world doesn't care about us or God or anything else. They don't even believe in him, most of them. And, and so uh, they, they shouldn't be judged like that, how they handle the presence of God. But we should because we've been taught how to. There's a certain way to live. And it looks to me like David said, yeah, the Philistines used a new cart, so we should use a new cart. Rather than, how does God want it done? What's the world doing now? How are they doing it? Now, so many things to say that I think might get us in the wrong place. So I want to be careful. 
But David was now moving the ark, the presence of God, the way the world moved things. This never works when it comes to worshiping God. Never. The, listen, the way of God, you ready for this? Listen to me, young people. You listen to me especially, but all of us. This is so important. The way of God, the way of God that comes out of his word is never irrelevant. Never. It's never outdated. It's never for another time, but not now. It's never old school. Never. The Bible follows us right into our age, right into our time, and always fits perfectly right there. It moves with time. Time doesn't change it. There's not some relevant form of Scripture that wasn't relevant for somebody that lived in 1610. Relevancy is how you dress it. Relevancy is lights, cameras, action. If you were here on Easter, a thunderstorm that went from front to back of the room. Whoa. How cool was that? We had surround sound in the building. We were trying to figure out how to blow mist out on y'all so you could have a true Disney experience. (laughs) You say, Russ, is it wrong to do that? Like have haze so you can see the light beams and things are more colorful? There's nothing wrong with any of that. Just know what it is and what it isn't. It isn't a new way of preaching. It isn't a new way of making disciples. It isn't a new way of surrendering to God. It isn't a new way of singing. It isn't a new way of serving. It isn't a new way of loving Jesus. It isn't a new way of raising your hands. It isn't. None of that stuff is. All of this is just stuff we dress up to make all the things that really matter more fun and easier to do. That's what they are. But they're nothing else. I'm not putting God on a new cart. He doesn't come on a new cart. He comes away on the shoulders of men and women of God worshiping and praising him. So if you get around somebody and go, oh, that's outdated. The method or the fact that they don't have lights, is that what you're saying? Or do they not have a air conditioning or soft chairs? Or I don't know. What are you talking about whenever you say that he's not relevant? Because God is relevant. If you're lost, a Savior is very relevant. If you're lonely, one who said, I will never leave you nor forsake you is very relevant. If you've got a disease in your body, him who said, I am your healer is very relevant. For those of you who are about to lose your marriage, him who says, I will take the valleys and I will fill them in and build a highway so you can make your way is very relevant. Scripture and Jesus and the Holy Spirit have never been more relevant than they are right now. Never. Don't find some new way of doing it. Use all the stuff to dress it up. Hallelujah for you. But don't create a new way of doing what's always worked. The new cart will cause somebody to die. got to watch out for new carts. That's the fourth thing, and I'm done, sort of. (laughs) Ignoring biblical directives will have a devastating impact on the next generation. David's disregard and the priest's disregard for the law and how to do it cost a young man his life. He was just doing out, he was out, he wasn't doing anything wrong. He was just out there doing what anybody would do who had been led to that. You wonder if his dad didn't scratch his head when he got home and thought about his dead son and went, I knew better. I knew that wasn't supposed to be on a cart. I've lost a son. Anybody here? You hearing me? Listen, church, not old people, you're almost done. You. You. You better start thinking about the next generation right now. I was taught when I was your age that I didn't exist for my generation. I mean, when I was your age, they said, no, we're not talking about your generation. 
We weren't nearly as selfish then as the generation that exists now. I'm not talking about you, but the world you live in. And man, we were taught, you live for the next generation and the next generation. You build for them. I'm telling you the same thing. You better find out what's new cart and get rid of it. You better find out what's historic, timeless, and truth and inject it into your life or your children are lost. And a lot of you have time to ramp back up and get back in the game, do what you know you should be doing. Because if we don't finish strong, if we don't finish finding truth and re investing it into our life, if you don't come out of your boredom and apathy and tiredness, if you don't come out of your long list of failed attempts, if you're passing off this baton to another generation, you ain't dead. You don't pass a baton till you die. And we try to save another generation by holding to these truths. We don't want a bunch of dead kids around an ox cart that wasn't supposed to be there because we didn't teach them how to follow Jesus like Jesus is supposed to be followed. I'm done. I'm done. One last thought after I'm done. <laughs> you can't get saved any way you want to get saved. You can't give your life, you can't make it to heaven any way you want. All these new carts that people have sent you, you ain't going to get there. I got a good heart, though. I don't care. If you didn't do it God's way, and it is very clear, Jesus said there's one way to God. Not ten, not two, one. He said, I am the truth and the life and the way. No man comes to the Father lest he comes through me. You can go try to get the ark and pull it up out of the woods, but you're going to have to do it God's way or it won't work for you. And if you have never said, Jesus, I am a sinner, that's why there's distance. I don't have the Holy Spirit living in me. That's why I can't feel you. I need to cry out to you who died on the cross for my sin and sent your spirit to fill me for you to save me to the uttermost. I need a savior. I want to make you Lord. And if you've never done that and taken the steps to bear fruit to repentance, you're deceived. No hands raised today. Father, I pray for everybody in this room especially those who are sure they're saved but they've never done what I just said. I pray they go to their life group and tell somebody this week, I'm not born again. I've never done that. I pray they get on a phone. I pray they tell somebody before they walk out of here that they won't say, I have a good heart and have never done the right thing. And I pray every person in this room who thinks they're saved is saved for the right reasons and it's done today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Look up here and look at the screen with me. I'm going to summarize this message and then we're going to do a couple of things and go home. So here, let's go to the screen. We're going to put them all up. Here we go. Number one. There must be a great respect and awe and reverence when we enter the ritual set aside for pursuing his presence. Now I'm going to put these up here and then I want you to take a picture of them and I want you to take them to your life group with them, with you. All right? There must be a great respect, awe, and reverence when we enter the rituals set aside for the pursuing of his presence. I want you to talk about that. Number two, God has a way for us to live. The Bible lays it out clearly. Where it is obscure, you know, what to do. Sometimes the Bible's obscure on it. We're free to work through it. God just says, work through it. Come up with your own plan. But with the parts that are very clear, we are mandated to obey, not question. Obey. Number three, passionate expression and reverent ritual 
are both, everybody say both, equal parts of worshiping Jesus. Need both. Last one, ignoring the biblical way of living will eventually lead the next generation away from Jesus. All right, leave them up there. Now get your phones out and take a picture of that. Now you can pull a sermon back up on live stream after they get it posted and that'll be at the end so you can use that. But if not, take a picture of it and remember those four summarizing statements so this message can work inside of you throughout the course of the week. Because I believe God is birthing, I'm seeing it, I'm actually seeing little, little signs of revival in our midst. I'm seeing little things. But enculturation is one way the enemy beats us out of it. Ignoring the scriptures and being right-hearted in revival but not smart in scripture has hurt revivals. I don't want a little moment and we go, hey, we're better now. I want us to seize this city to the glory of God. So this message is really, really important to me. Hallelujah. We're going to receive the Sunday morning tithes and offerings. So if you'll prepare yourself to give this morning, uh, I'd appreciate it. Uh, you can do it several ways. You can text uh, South Point CC to uh, 77977. You can, obviously, if you're giving online and you're doing, you've already set that up. You can go to our app and use our app. You can use the envelopes that are in the chairs in front of you to give cash or check. Drop it in the offering boxes on your way out this morning. I appreciate so much your faithfulness. And, uh, and uh, you've been a blessing to us. We're in a good place. God is helping us. And uh, I'm very, very thankful for all of you. Let's pray over your offering right now, if you'll just pray. Father God. We thank you for the ability to give, the ability to worship you. You prescribed a way for this. You said, this is how you do it. We always tend to want to come up with a new plan. But you said, this is the way. And so, Lord God, we're just going to follow your way and look for your blessing. Bless every giver as they give. Give them back a manifold return that they're shocked about so that they can give and give and give. Lord, we love you and praise you and give you glory. In Jesus' name, and everybody said... Amen. Thank you for your faithfulness. All right. And those of you online, I hope you jumped online in the chat box there and gave. I hope you did. All right. Um, one last thing before we go home. And I mean, it really is one last thing. We're there. We made it. And, um, but thank you for listening to me today. And I really hope you take this message and think about it way deeper throughout the week. Am I doing it to the prescribed way? Am I living by the word? Or am I just claiming a good heart. Ignorance has a limit. Anyhow, I'm going to show you a picture of our park. And I uh, want to show you, the park is open, by the way. Everybody knows that, I think. It's open. But watch this. They put together a video of it going up. So here we go. One of the things that we feel important right now is going forward is to do as much as we possibly can to help our families grow and mature and have safe spaces to have their kids, to be out with other moms, the families to gather. We also have all of our teenagers and college students. They need safe places to go. So we're going to build an entire family park. We have to help the next generation. And everybody said...
I, I want to I take a minute uh, before you go to the house. The park's been open. There's been somebody out there every day. There are people out there every day uh, since it's opened and kids run around out there and it's just been great. And, and, uh, but a, a lot of people gave a little extra to making this happen. So um, I'm just going to acknowledge a few. On staff, Jason Curley was amazing running the whole project. Just did a great, great job, honestly. I don't know where I'd have been without him running it, and, uh, and so that was great. But then also, anything that happens outside or with building around here, Doug is always somewhere, and is always a blessing, like you can't believe, and we count on him, and so Doug has been amazing, so I want to acknowledge wherever Doug is, somewhere, and, um, and uh, Doug Bailey on staff here. Uh, and a lot of our team has done different things, but, and then of course my Debbie is always in colors and all of that stuff, and uh, I never acknowledge her on stuff like this, but she is always in, I want to know about that, I'm going to be consulted first, and, uh, and, uh, and, and always helps us get better. Can we give my bride a good hand for all that she does around here? The park is going to be more than I thought. It's going to be better than I thought. Um, the design of it the way it is, the way the moms are going to be out there, the families are going to be out there. There's going to be a lot of discipleship out there. Uh, the volleyball thing's going to open up Tuesday night for the college kids. They're going to use it Tuesday night. And uh, the sand volleyball pit's going to be used out there. And it's, it's just seeing more and more pieces of it get used. And uh, we've already seen guys out there. Uh, we almost lost a dad on the basketball court already. First night out, almost lost Issa to a wound. And uh, in the, so he was laying on the ground. His son was looking at him going, come on, Dad. And, uh, and so, but anyway, I'm just teasing. He did fall. And uh, we have video of it. We have testimony. And, uh, and, and so then, uh, but, um, but then there's somebody, I'm, I'm not going to, uh, and I promise I wouldn't do that, but I do want to at least acknowledge them. Um, Meg Gaffney Cook is somewhere. Where are you, Meg? And, oh, left. There you are over there. Raise your hand again, Meg. There you are. Meg designed all that. Yeah. She's the architect who designed all that. And uh, she's been, when, when, Lauren, when Lauren brought Meg to us, and uh, she's been so fun to work with and so easy. And um, we've had to adjust and then adjust. And we're architect's nightmare. We run out of money. And, uh, and so then you go, oh, we ain't going to be able to do that. Let's do this. And you should have saw the first one. I mean, it looked like a Taj Mahal out there. And about $3 million later, we said, okay, we won't be doing that one. And, uh, and, uh, but, um, so, but she is, Meg, thank you for being a joy to work with. And it's been great to have you with us. And then I don't know where Brent went. Where is Brent? Are you over there too? Oh, hey, Brent. There's Brent. And uh, Brent has, has been the, uh, the company that did it was um, uh, Carter Construction. And... What did I say? Sorry, Brent. And uh, uh, Car Carlton Construction. And, um, uh, and he was the foreman on the project. And you talk about somebody that's been fun to work with, yeah. that understood us, got us, and demanded excellence over and over and over again. And because you always hope you get a GC that will come in and just actually care. And uh, from all that I could tell, Brent cared. Yeah. And uh, so thank you, Brent, for all that you were for us. And uh, appreciate it so much. All right. Now. But last but not least, we're going to have them come to the platform. So Lauren and Ian, if you'll come up here to the platform, and we want to have them up. Uh, Lauren and Ian, I'll tell you about them when they get here. Debbie, if you'll come up. We want to make a presentation, but, um, but uh, Lauren and Ian, in the beginning, they had designed a park at their neighborhood, and, um, at their neighborhood, and so we said, will you help us? And uh, so they jumped in in the beginning, and when I say helped, I mean, they, of course, if you know the Gilberts, they took over, and, uh, and, and, which is exactly what we wanted them to do, and uh, helped us with working through finding the architect, figuring out the GC, or I'm sorry, the construction company we would work with, all the fine details and all of that, and, um, and so they've been amazing. Debbie wanted to say something. Just one little thought on this, which is a huge, huge thought. Lauren has been absolutely amazing. And the reason behind all that is because she shared with me that she has prayed every day by name for all the workers that were involved in this. And to me, I just believe that because of her faithfulness and our staff, Jason and 
and Doug and everything that they've done, that we are going to see great fruits and a great harvest from what God has done through these people. And I just appreciate them so, so much. When, when, we, when we say attention to detail, <laughs> both of them, because Ian in the beginning, PowerPoint charts and all the way that it would work. I mean, I mean, it was just so much work, hours and hours and hours of work. And uh, so we wanted to bless them. Thank you, y'all, for loving the church, loving that, and being amazing at it and doing such a great job. And uh, love you guys to pieces. And uh, can we give them a big hand as they go down? Bless you guys. Jason, we'll get you. All right. Praise God. And, oh, you know what I did forget? Where are you? Thank you. We got saved by somebody in our church. We got in a mess, as you do in these projects. And I almost forgot again. We forgot him the first time, and then I almost forgot him again. So, Austin, you're the guy we forget. And, um, but Austin Heilig came in and helped us with a light situation that would have put us in a horrifying place had he not stepped in and has given of his time, his energy, free, and been a blessing to us. Austin, where are you? Are you in here somewhere? Is Austin Heilig in here? He's in, okay, he's walking around out there somewhere. Can we give Austin a big hand for all that he did? All right, we kept you a little bit longer, but we had water baptisms, and we wanted to make sure that we did this right. Thank you to you three and the team that worked with me. And the park is open, so the kids can go out there and play on it right after church, or as soon as it, they can go out there and have a big time. And you should go out there and check all the stuff out if you haven't seen it yet, if Easter was too busy for you. If you'll all stand, I'm going to put a prayer on the screen for you. I want you to say this together. Some people like to raise both their hands when they do it. You don't have to. But would you read this with me? Here's the, here it is. Let's do this together. Ready? As I go forth from this place, God goes before me. I am strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. I will shine the light of truth. I will be the salt of love. I am sanctified, consecrated, and separated from the world. I walk in his favor, and his blessings are overtaking me. My footsteps are ordered by the Lord. You have called your followers to go. Here I am, Lord. Send me. Use me for your purposes. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.